Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Brian Cunningham, and I'm with LPro Technologies. And today we're going to talk about how to program and use diagnostics on the 915U2 radio system. <clears throat> First of all, I just wanted to have a quick discussion of the uh, product line so that uh, uh, we're clear about exactly which product we're talking about here. Uh, these are all of the radios that uh, LPro manufactures. And today we're going to be talking about this one here, the 915U-2. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This uh, radio, the 915U2, is a 900 megahertz frequency hopping spread spectrum radio. So uh, spread spectrum means you can use it anywhere in North America. It is license uh, free. Uh, the customer does not need to apply to the FCC for a license because LPro has already got this radio certified. The 915 has a uh, full modbus capability. So it can act as the uh, Modbus uh, RTU uh, master or slave. And it can also do Ethernet uh, Modbus, Modbus TCP by acting as the Modbus server or the Modbus client. Uh, it has a built-in I.O. that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes uh, on this uh, terminal block uh, right here. And uh, if this I.O. is not enough, it can be expanded via RS-485. The radio portion has meshing capability. So what meshing refers to is uh, automatic repeater selection. So if uh, a normal path direct to a uh, remote radio is uh, lost, then the radio will automatically figure out which repeaters it should use to get the message uh, to the final destination. These radios are backward compatible with the 905U series. So they are considered the second generation of the 905U series uh, product. They have a built-in uh, battery charger that we're going to talk about more in uh, just a minute. The firmware is upgradable in these products, and uh, they have uh, AES 256-bit uh, encryption, which today is considered unhackable with uh, today's processing uh, ability. Uh, now, should that uh, change and uh, there is some uh, weakness uh, discovered in AES encryption uh, years from now in the future, these radios can be upgraded via firmware. So new features, uh, new software features can be easily added by uh, just simply upgrading the firmware of these radios. So that is how we make this radio future proof. Okay, this uh, diagram here, just a quick block diagram of what's inside the radio. Uh, first of all, we have the radio interface. Uh, then we have the uh, database, the I.O. store. And this radio has uh, about a thousand registers on board, so it can store data from uh, literally hundreds of remote uh, radios. By the way, I should uh, mention that the largest network that we have installed uh, is approximately 3,500 radios as of last count. Now, that network was actually broken down into several smaller sub-networks to make it more manageable. Uh, onboard, uh, this shows you the onboard I.O. Uh, this shows the digital inputs and outputs, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have an Ethernet port and the I.O. expansion port that I'll show you more about <coughs> in just a minute. <coughs> For the I.O. connections for 4 to 20 milliamp inputs and outputs and voltage uh, signal inputs and outputs, first of all, we have eight D.I.O. So you can see they're just labeled uh, D1 through D8. Uh, so they can function as inputs or outputs, but obviously not at the same time. And each D digital point has an LED right next to it. So if you just look at the LED and you see whether it's on or it's off, it tells you whether the... Uh, the I.O. point is active or inactive. We have four 4 to 20 milliamp uh, inputs. Two of them are differential type inputs, and two of them are single-ended uh, inputs. The single-ended inputs refers to uh, ground as the negative terminal for all of the uh, inputs. The differential inputs have both a plus and a minus. So we have AI1 uh, plus, and AI1 minus, 
Then we have AI1 plus and AI2 minus. So these are where you wire the, the 4 to 20 milliamp positive and negative uh, connections. Then for A3 and A4, they are single-ended. So these are the positive terminals, and the negative terminal of the 4 to 20 milliamp signal goes into the ground. And I have another diagram that clarifies exactly what is intended or what is meant by these single-ended and differential inputs in, in the next slide here. There's two analog outputs. They will power the 4 to 20 milliamps, so they will drive uh, power into the uh, external device. And we also have an analog loop supply of, of 24 volts. So even if the power supply of the radio is only a 12 volt power supply, internally the radio bumps that up to 24 volts. And then the uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, then this 24 volts is available to power uh, loop-powered instruments. This diagram here shows the difference between a, a differential or a, a floating input and a single-ended and a grounded uh, input. The main difference is that with a single-ended, the power supply always has to be in one specific location. So the power supply negative must be connected to the ground terminal on the radio itself. As well, this radio, this power supply is, uh, is most likely powering the radio so it's, it, it itself. In fact, it would have to be, otherwise we would create a condition of uh, possible ground loops. So that means that if this four to 20 milliamp instruments negative is grounded to earth, and the radio must also be grounded to earth, then this will create a ground loop uh, condition whereby the current flowing from this power supply goes into the instrument, but the instrument is grounded and that current then flows uh, through the piping and machinery and uh, the electrical enclosure directly to the radio's ground. It does not, it will not flow through the radio's analog input so the radio can measure it. So therefore, it's important that we make sure that these, these, the output of these instruments aren't connected to earth ground if we're wiring it in this fashion. If there is no option, then all we have to do is we just have to insert a loop isolator between the instrument and the radio's 4 to 20 milliamp input. <clears throat> With a differential input or a floating input, uh, the uh, instrument can be wired anywhere in the loop. <clears throat> so. Uh, there is no there is no issue with it potentially uh, connecting to uh, uh, to ground in this fashion. So that's what's meant between a differential input and a single ended or grounded uh, input. Okay. So uh, next are the power and data connections, and these can be seen on the bottom of the radio. We'll just start with a power connection. For uh, a standard 24 volt power supply, we would connect it between supply plus and supply minus. And this is suitable for 15 to 30 volts uh, regulated DC power supplies. If we happen to have a 12 volt power source, we would connect it between battery and ground. And the battery power supply is uh, suitable for 12 to 15 volts DC. It'll actually work a little lower than that. I think the spec is actually uh, about 10 volts uh, DC. Now, if we have uh, 24 volts applied across these two terminals, then the radio produces a trickle charge on the battery and ground terminals. The idea being that you can have a 12 volt lead acid battery powering the radio whenever 24 volts power is lost. And that allows for seamless operation of the, uh, of the radio, regardless of uh, mains uh, power being available or unavailable. Uh, then we have our serial port here. Uh, this is actually an RJ45 jack. So this connector looks identical to this connector over here. So when we're plugging in our Ethernet cable, it's important that we make sure we're plugging it into the correct RJ45 jack. And we can observe that or confirm that by looking at these two LEDs to make sure that they are on. Uh, the reason we don't have a DB9 connector simply was not enough space on the circuit board to uh, mount one, so we had to go to an RJ45 jack. Then we have a USB uh, port. This is for programming only. It's not for data communications. 
My preference is always to use the Ethernet port. I find this to be uh, simpler, and uh, we uh, are always uh, uh, connecting these to Modbus devices, etc. So I prefer to use the Ethernet port for programming. Just my personal preference. Then we have the expansion I/O terminal block uh, A and B. These are the uh, RS45 connections. And the plus and minus, this is for powering uh, serial expansion modules that you can connect with. So the RS-45, this can be used either for Modbus RTU or it can be used for I.O. expansion. Okay, this is the uh, this is a typical setup that you'll find with the 915U2. Uh, and this is what we are going to uh, replicate uh, today when we get into the programming section here. So we've got uh, a 4 to 20 milliamp output going to um, you know, a pump or a machine of, uh, of some sort. Uh, we have a 4 to 20 milliamp input, in this case coming from a pressure transmitter. Then we have a uh, digital input and a digital output, uh, you know, coming from like a pressure switch, level switch, temperature switch, digital output going to a pump or any kind of on-off uh, device. And we have the same setup on the opposite uh, end. Okay, so that's uh, primarily it for the uh, uh, PowerPoint portion of this. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is we're going to uh, uh, head to our software, our meshing configuration software. We're going to set up these radios. But one of the first things we need to do is we need to find out what is the IP address of the radio that we are connected to. Now, if these are brand new radios right out of the box, then the uh, IP address is printed on the side label, and it's called the setup IP address. And these radios have a, a DIT switch that allows you to cycle the radio between the setup and run mode. In setup mode, the IP address reverts to the default IP address printed on the side label, so that you can easily uh, access the radio without having to uh, guess what the IP address is. But I'm going to show you a program called Angry IP Scanner. And this is a very useful program. I've uh, set it up to scan this range of IP addresses. And I'm going to hit Start. <laughs> and what the uh, program does is it scans all of these different IP addresses to find out which one uh, the radio has inside of it. <laughs> and this is a very helpful, very useful uh, program. Now you can see this is my computer's uh, uh, Ethernet port. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, identified that one, and it's my uh, ASUS uh, laptop. And we're going to scroll down a little bit here, and we're going to find out uh, what the IP address of the radio. And there it is. The IP address of the radio is 192.168.0.183. So I just wanted to illustrate this uh, to you because uh, this is a uh, great uh, program. Uh, it's ver been very useful, very helpful, and we'll need that information when we go to program these radios. So the next step is to run our meshing configuration uh, program. And uh, what we need to do is we're, we're going to create a new project. It's going to ask us what country the radio is located in because we build different versions of these radios for uh, different regions of the world that use different portions of the 900 megahertz band. So we're in North America. We'll select this one. And it asks uh, for a project uh, name. Okay, we're just going to select their uh, default and hit uh, save. Then the first thing it pops up with is just our uh, home screen uh, here. And what we have to do is we need to click on a units, and then we need to begin adding radios to the project tree. So we have to tell it what model of radio we have uh, in front of us today. And today we have two 915U2 radios. So I've added the first radio to the project tree, and now I'll go ahead and add the second radio to our project tree. This can all be done in advance without actually having the radios in front of you. So you can completely set all these radios up, and then once you have the hardware in front of you, then you can download that to each unit. Okay. Uh, the radios have a uh, number of different options. If you click on the uh, arrows next to it, 
it expands the tree to, uh, uh, to show you all of the different options. Now I'm gonna change the names of these radios to make it uh, easier to understand. I'm gonna call this one the base radio, and then I'm gonna call uh, the second radio our remote. Okay, so I'm gonna head back to our uh, base radio here. And this is where we would uh, look at a, a variety of different uh, parameters in these uh, radios here. But the main, the most important parameter are the mappings. Mappings are how we transfer 4 to 20 milliamp and discrete signals from one radio to the other. So we just click on add to create a new mapping. And then we have our, our mapping menu pops up. There are three types of mappings that we could uh, that we could create. We can create a right mapping, which uh, takes a, uh, uh, a either a single variable or consecutive variables of the same type and sends them to the opposite radio. We can do a read mapping, which pulls a, uh, some variables from the opposite radio and sends them to this radio. So in other words, it's a mapping in the opposite direction of a, a read is the opposite direction of a right. Or we have a gather scatter map. And what a gather scatter is, it allows you to send several different types of IO, in other words, analog and digital IO in a single transmission. So I'm gonna set that up and uh, I'm going to, uh, then I have to select the destination. Where do I want to send this data to? So I'm uh, connected to the base radio. I want to send it to the remote uh, radio. Now, you can either send these commands out the radio port, which is what we do uh, about 90% of the time, or maybe 99% of the time, or we can send a command to the Ethernet port of the radio. But these radios are going to be connected via a radio link, so we always, uh, or 99% of the time, we want to select the remote radio's radio port. Then we have to tell it how many data points do we want to send. One, you're just going to pick uh, two data points. We'll send one analog value and one digital value. Okay. Then we have to select the local address. So this is where on this base radio, which signals we want to send to the remote. Okay. So then when we click there, we have uh, all of the different I.O. on board the radio. We've got uh, all kinds of uh, uh, the, the physical I.O. tied to the terminal blocks, but we also have uh, uh, hundreds of just generic data points where we can write to them from Modbus. Okay. So for today, I'm going to grab uh, digital input number one, and I'm going to send this to the remote uh, radio's uh, uh, digital output number one okay and we'll hit apply okay then we're going to take a 4 to 20 milliamp signal so here we would go to uh, analog inputs and we'll take analog input number one and hit apply then for the remote address we would select uh, analog outputs and we're going to send that to analog output number one okay so I've just set up a very basic mapping, DI1 to DO1, analog input one to analog output one, going from our base radio to this remote unit here. Now next, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, click Acknowledge, and I'm gonna select a fail register. And what this does is uh, I'm gonna select digital output eight. So digital output eight is going to turn on on this radio up here if this mapping fails. Now these messages are acknowledged uh, automatically uh, in the background, but they're usually only acknowledged just to the first repeater. And then the first repeater sends it to the next uh, repeater or the final destination. But with acknowledge, it's acknowledged all the way through all the repeaters to the final destination. So we know for sure that that remote radio got this message, not just the first repeater or the second repeater, but all the way through to the final destination. If the LED next to digital output eight is off, this message was, uh, was successful and it worked just fine. 
If D08 is on, then this mapping uh, fails. Okay? And because there's a LED right next to it, super easy to tell whether it worked or not, uh, just by looking at the LED and seeing whether it's on or off. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to head over to advanced. Uh, we have a, uh, a built-in delay of one second. I'm going to drop that down to zero. Uh, this is just so that if we got some noise, uh, the, uh, the radio would not transmit that noise uh, value across. So if we set it for one second, it means that the uh, input has to stabilize at its final value for a minimum of one second, and then the radio transmits it. Okay. So these radios uh, monitor for change of state, and that's, this is why we have the update time set to a, a fairly long time frame, like uh, 10, 10 minutes uh, normal. Now I'm going to change this, and I'm going to make it a lot faster. I'm going to set it to uh, five seconds so that we don't have to wait so long for uh, transmissions uh, to occur. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> uh, now that we've set that to uh, five seconds, this radio is going to transmit every five seconds of these values, even if they don't change. Uh, for customers' installations, we do recommend you just leave it at 10 minutes, because uh, we could have hundreds of radios all uh, potentially trying to transmit. And if we have them transmitting every five seconds, well, we jam the, band, the airwaves with too much bandwidth and some of the messages may not get through. But just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to set this to five seconds. Okay, then we hit apply and uh, we're done. We're going to send analog input uh, uh, DI1 to DO1 and uh, also uh, uh, analog, uh, analog input one to analog output one. Now, I'm just going to give you a super, rundown, super quick rundown of the rest of these uh, parameters, just so you, you kind of know what they are. Uh, networking, uh, this is where we would, uh, this is how we change the IP address of the Ethernet port of these uh, radios here. Uh, the RS-232 port, we can set this up for uh, Modbus RTU Master, Expansion I.O., or Modbus RTU Slave modes. Uh, the RS-45 port uh, operates independently of the RS-232 port and has the same options here. Okay, I'm going to turn this uh, uh, RS-45 port off for now because we are not using it. Then we have Modbus uh, set up here, uh, Modbus TCP and client mode, uh, and, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, Modbus TCP client and RTU master mode or TCP server and RTU slave uh, modes uh, are how we, uh, you know, we have, this is where we would set all of this uh, up. Okay, then we have our I.O. and we can uh, change a few parameters like uh, the debounce time. This is how long a, uh, uh, a signal must uh, be in the on state before it transmits or in the off state. This is designed for mechanical relays which have contact valves. This eliminates that issue. Then your digital outputs, we've got some fail-safe uh, time. So this is what state the digital output will go to if it does not receive a transmission within a certain uh, time frame. And uh, then we have pulse uh, outputs, uh, analog uh, inputs. We can do scaling and things like that. Analog outputs, again, these are just fail-safe values. If the radio loses communications, what do you want to happen to the analog outputs? This is where we would add serial expansion modules. This is where we would set up our thermal couple module if we had one plugged into the radio. Fail safe blocks. This allows you to uh, 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 initialize registers so that upon power up, they are set to a certain value. And if communications are lost, this also allows you to have them go to a predetermined value. Then we have our sensitivity blocks. And this is, uh, for example, analog input one. Uh, this is how much it has to change uh, before uh, it uh, goes ahead and transmits value. So in this case, it's set to 3% of 20 milliamps, which equates to a half a milliamp. So if this analog channel changes by more than half a milliamp, it goes ahead and transmits that value immediately. Okay, so uh, that's just a quick rundown. Uh, then I wanted to show you the IP address list. 
Now, the radio port on each, on each device has a different IP address than the Ethernet port, but it is the Ethernet port that we are mainly concerned with. Now, the default is that they're all set, all radios have the Ethernet port set to the same IP address because these radios are not bridging devices. So this ether, Ethernet port can never be connected to this Ethernet port here. And that was done for security reasons. So that if somebody were to uh, uh, obtain access to the Ethernet port of one radio, they wouldn't be able to log into a remote radio and change its configuration uh, over the air. Now, it is possible to set these radios up for over-the-air configuration, but it can only be done from one master base radio. And again, it's done for security reasons. You don't want somebody at a remote site breaking into an electrical cabinet, plugging into that uh, radio, and then changing parameters on other remote radios or even the base radio. So uh, the uh, Ethernet ports are not merged together for security uh, reasons on this particular uh, product. So that is why we can have the Ethernet ports all with the same address. <clears throat> and it makes it simpler. You drive out to a remote site, no guessing what the IP address is, uh, no having to run our angry IP scanner. We know what they are because they're all the same at all remote sites. Okay, so then we need to uh, begin programming our uh, radios. So I'm going to hit uh, Program Unit. And uh, you remember when we ran our angry IP scanner? that we saw that 183 was the IP address of this radio. Now, after I finish programming it, it's going to be set to .99, but right now it's uh, .183. So I'm going to program the radio. You can see it's uh, going ahead. This message just uh, tells us that the what's in the radio is, is going to be changed and can continue with the configuration. Okay, so uh, that particular radio is now uh, programmed uh, and it is rebooting. So it'll reboot in about 60 seconds. This is just a generic uh, counter. It's not actually communicating with the radio to calculate this. Um, it's uh, the radios uh, with the newer versions of firmware are a little bit faster. So the next thing I will do is I'm going to uh, uh, click to my remote radio, my second radio. I'm going to hit program unit. I know that on that radio, I've already run angry IP scanner, so I know its IP address is 184. I'm going to take my Ethernet cable, unplug it from one radio, plug it into uh, the second radio, and hit uh, OK. Okay, the programming process should take uh, just two or three seconds, as you saw. And uh, there we go. Okay, so that second radio is uh, now rebooting. And we'll just give that a, uh, a minute or so to uh, finish its uh, process. And I'm going to plug the Ethernet cable back into the first radio. That's it has almost finished its uh, boot uh, process. <laughs> Okay, so we're just uh, waiting for these uh, radios to finish uh, booting up. And uh, yeah, it looks like the first one is done. So then uh, what we're going to do is we're uh, uh, going we're gonna go into uh, the, first of all, we can have a look at the monitor communications. I'm not sure if we're going to see too much at the moment because we're still waiting for the second radio to boot up. But we're just going to see, you know, what do we see at the moment here? Yeah, we should probably see some uh, outbound uh, pings uh, uh, from one radio to the other here. Okay, so uh, some basic information that you can see here. So that tells you the, uh, the timestamp for the radio. Uh, this, uh, let's see, I think that is the system address of this uh, radio. Oh, there we go. Okay, now we can see a bunch of uh, traffic. The second radio has finished booting up. We can see this tells you the exact frequency that it's uh, transmitting. 
Uh, we can see the received signal strength here. It is uh, negative 43. These radios are side by side. I do have antennas, uh, attenuators connected in series with the antenna. And uh, this just tells you uh, what type of messages are going uh, back and forth. So we can see, uh, uh, let's see, this is a transmit. So that was the radio sending those 4 to 20 uh, values uh, back. And then this is the acknowledgement uh, coming back. Okay. So these radios are successfully communicating. You can see the RSSI pretty much rock steady right here. Uh, again, I do have these attenuators because otherwise uh, these radios would saturate because they are uh, the signal strength is so strong. So this just gives you a rough idea of uh, what's going on to make sure these radios are uh, communicating uh, properly. And we can see the source IP address. So this is the radio IP address of this unit up here. And this is the radio IP address of this guy uh, down here. Okay, so I'm going to close that one right there. <clears throat> and uh, then we will head to uh, monitor, uh, sur sorry, uh, IO diagnostics. So the monitor comms just gives you an idea of how much traffic and lets you know what the RSSI uh, values are. Okay, so uh, next we're going to see if we can read some of the uh, IO points on this uh, radio. Okay. Now, I don't have any signals uh, wired in uh, to the radio right now. So uh, therefore, we can see analog input uh, number one is showing zero milliamps, and same with analogs two, three, and four. Okay. We can also see our power supply voltages. This is the main power supply. This is the analog output. And this is the battery uh, voltage. Then the last one here is the uh, power, the voltage on the I/O expansion uh, module. Okay, so let's just show you uh, what's going on with your uh, with your I/O points. We can see our digital inputs; uh, they're all set to uh, off at the moment. And if I take a jumper wire across uh, any of the DIs to uh, short it to ground, you you will see them uh, turn on. Okay, so uh, this is a quick check of what your 4 to 20 milliamp uh, values are doing. Now, this is, this, is, this is the basic diagnostics available in, in the meshing configuration software. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, head to our uh, browser program, and I'm going to uh, log into uh, this radio here. So what we do is we just uh, back up. We uh, hit 192.168.0. Dot 99 because this is the IP address we've now programmed into this radio. So I have to sign in. The default is user and user, all lowercase. Okay. And uh, here we go. This is the web page diagnostics for these radios. So the login page, this tells you uh, the setup versus run mode dip switch we are currently in run mode this tells you the name of the radio system the serial number uh, and the firmware version those are the most important uh, pieces now if this radio were in setup mode the uh the, the uh, default ip address would be the one printed on the side label called setup ip and it would also show you that the radio firmware version is not available. And that is because the radio module is powered off when the radio is in setup mode. Okay. So then you can see these are all the different uh, parameters that we have. These are for, uh, uh, for these are all the functions that we have on the, uh, the Windows-based software. They're all duplicated right here. Uh, the most important one you might want to use is going to be the system tools. <clears throat> and this allows you to do a couple of things, uh, but the most common thing I'm finding I'm doing is the factory default configuration reset uh, to clear out any parameters because, you know, there's probably two or three hundred different parameters in this radio. So we can uh, clear them all out and then reprogram the unit and get it to what we would like it to be done. But we can do firmware upgrades. We can reconfigure this product to make it backward compatible with the 905U series. 
as well as we can read and write configuration files to the radio. Okay, so a couple of different parameters, they're all under system tools there. Okay, now the next one is uh, that we want to have a look at uh, the IO diagnostics. Uh, that is a repeat of the same menu that we saw earlier. So, for example, uh, if I want to have a look at uh, analog input uh, one, that's registered 30,000 uh, and one. Well, why don't I look at uh, why I look at analog inputs one through four, and I can click read. And there we go. I can see uh, 8192. Uh, this is our factory default for uh, zero milliamps going into the radio. So 8192 byte counts equals zero milliamps. So I can also write values uh, to these uh, uh, to these radios. So I can turn on the dish, turn on and off the digital outputs uh, if I so desire. Okay. So that's the I/O diagnostics. The next one is the connectivity screen. <clears throat> and this is one that we use a lot. So uh, this is saying the this is telling us that we have a total entry of we have one remote radio that this base radio can see. Uh, it is only one hop away, meaning that it is in direct connection. If this radio were going through repeaters, we would see you know two or three hops, and this this tells you the number of repeaters uh, uh, in between. This shows the received signal strength indication. This is probably one of the most important parameters that we look at for these radios. And then this is the quality measure. The quality value of 100 indicates that no forward error correction has been required and that the radio has not had to do any retries to get the messages uh, across. Okay. The rest of the information is, uh, the rest of the stuff here is not really all that uh, useful, uh, sort of useful uh, to us as customers. These are more for the engineers uh, at the factory troubleshooting uh, uh, the radio systems in the design process. Okay. Uh, the next is the neighbor list. And uh, this just shows a single entry here. There is a single remote radio with a radio IP address of 50.2. Uh, it has been online with us. Uh, or the last transmission it received was 1.7 seconds prior to me clicking on this page. So this tells you the last time that we got an update from this radio here. So oftentimes if you have the, the update time set to 10 minutes, then you might see values like five minutes or eight minutes or something like that. You should always see a value less than the update time of the, of the last transmission. Negative 43, this is the RSSI of this uh, radio. Uh, so that's the neighbor list. Normally, we might see like 20 or 30 radios, all with their radio IPs, all with the last time they communicated with the uh, base radio, and then all of their RSSI uh, values. So that's typical what we see in a, in a larger uh, network. Then we have neighbor RSSI. And what this uh, allows us to do is to see what the RSSI is across all of the different frequency channels. So I have to type in the radio's uh, IP address, 192.168.50.2. Uh, and I hit uh, get graph. <clears throat> and this is showing me that radio communications are pretty steady across all of the different frequencies. So this radio is set to use uh, the lower half of the 900 megahertz band. And we uh, divide that in 50 frequencies. We can also set this radio to use the upper half if we desire. So this is showing uh, zero is gonna be about 902, 49 is gonna be about uh, 915 megahertz, or 916 actually. And this is showing that the RSSI is very steady. There is uh, no multi-path conditions that are occurring in this case. Now, if we saw a steep dive going down at one particular frequency, we would know that a multipath condition is occurring uh, on that frequency. So that might uh, give us a clue that uh, maybe we need to uh, offset the antenna so it's not so close to a metal surface that is uh, reflecting the radio waves and creating that multipath uh, condition. So uh, this shows you what the RSSI is. Right now, this is an ideal uh, condition here. 
the RSSI is the same at all frequencies, so we know this radio is going to perform very well. Okay. Then we can go to uh, network diagnostics, and we can ping the remote uh, radios. So uh, I'll do uh, enter in the IP address, the radio IP of that remote radio. Let's say uh, 50.2, and then uh, we can hit a ping. So we can ping that radio uh, via our onboard uh, diagnostics. We can, we, we can make sure that we can access that uh, radio. So it looks like uh, everything was uh, successful here. We uh, pinged it four times. The average time was 236 uh, milliseconds. That would be typical for this particular radio, uh, going through uh, no repeaters with a direct connection. Uh, so uh, these radios are, uh, the, the over there data rate of these radios uh, can be adjusted, but the default is uh, that it's at, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I think the default is 19.2 kilobits per second. And we can set it to uh, 76 or 115 kilobits per second. But when we're just sending 4 to 20 milliamp signals, there is no need for super high speed communications. So uh, this is telling us 236 milliseconds to get uh, the message uh, replied, to get the reply from the remote uh, radio. Now we can also do a trace route. And what this would show us is what repeaters are in between uh, a remote uh, radio. Now in this case, we're uh, just doing something really simple here. We just have two radios, so it's not really gonna illustrate uh, anything too, uh, uh, too, um, uh, too informative at this point. Okay. Okay, so that's our network uh, diagnostics. Uh, then we have our network uh, statistics, and we can go ahead and hit uh, read. <clears throat> okay, and it just gives us uh, uh, some basic uh, information about uh, uh, how many packets per minute are we sending uh, over the radio uh, network here. Okay, so this just tells us is this network really busy? or is it pretty slow? And right now, uh, we don't have much data going across. Uh, if we had uh, 20 or 30 remote radios, we'd probably see some much higher numbers. This would give us an idea. Are we uh, overburdening the radio network with too much traffic or not? Okay. So uh, yeah, just some, some basic network statistics to find out uh, usage uh, of, the, of the radio network. How busy is that frequency channel that we're uh, that we're using? Okay, then we have our monitor uh, radio communications, <clears throat> same as what we saw with the Windows-based uh, configuration. Every I set this up to transmit every five seconds, so we're seeing uh, a transmit here, and we can see it's followed by the acknowledgement uh, coming back, and. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, then we can see the, the transmit and receive uh, frequencies. And this is all of the information that was sent uh, over the air. So this is the LPRO uh, protocol as to how we've uh, divided, uh, you know, how we convert 4 to 20 milliamp signals into a hex number. And then we transmit it over the air. And we're going to have some information like uh, system address, the sending radios ID, the destination radios uh, identification. Uh, then we would have uh, some preamble to indicate that, you know, this is an analog value and then a discrete, then the actual values. And then we would have the last four uh, digits would be the CRC error check. Okay. So just shows you what's going on, shows you what frequencies are transmitting on and this sort of thing. So you can get an idea as to, uh, uh, what the radio is doing uh, over the year. Okay. Then we have uh, monitor IP communications, and this is showing you what goes over the Ethernet uh, port. Okay, so let's uh, we'll stop this guy here. Oh, let's stop. Head over to uh, monitor uh, IP comms. <coughs> And then we should uh, see our next uh, menu here, but uh, for some reason that's not popping up. 
I wonder why we've got some sort of slowdown here on my uh, computer. Let's just see if we can take ourselves back to our home page. And we'll uh, uh, wrap this one up. So these are the diagnostics menus that we've got right here. Uh, they're going to help you troubleshoot your radio links. The most important ones are going to be the uh, neighbor list, which shows you the RSSI of all your remote uh, units. Ah, oh, there we go. I think it. Uh, I think it actually might be my computer. I'm not sure if it's a, uh, what that delay was caused by, but I can actually hear my computer's fan gearing up to high speed, which means that it was processing something quite intense. Uh, so I hear that every now and again on this laptop. So I'm uh, I'm wondering if this computer might be getting a little uh, burdened. Uh, down. But uh, this is pretty much the end of uh, today's uh, session here. Uh, this should have given you, uh, hopefully, a good introduction to the, uh, uh, the Elpro uh, 915U2, showing you how to program it with the Windows-based software and set up a very basic configuration and then diagnose it with, the, uh, with our diagnostics here. Okay, so that concludes uh, today's uh, webinar.